my presentation today is on whether we could make it illegal to drive while fatigued. So in Australia and also in most Western industrialized nations, we know that driver fatigue contributes to about 20% of vehicle crashes. And over recent decades, we know that the number of crashes caused by fatigue has, hasn't really changed. So it's remained relatively stable as a proportion of the population. Um, over this same time though, we know that crashes caused by other factors have decreased significantly. So things like speeding and drink driving, we know that those crashes um, have declined over this same period. So why not fatigue? Now, if we take the case of drink driving related vehicle crashes, there's a few reasons why we've seen those really significant decreases in the number of crashes. So the first thing is strong public education campaigns. Um, so these public education campaigns that give people a clear way to decide whether they should drive or not. Um, of course, legislation being illegal to get behind the wheel if you're over 0.05 blood alcohol concentration in Australia. Um, and that also is associated with enforcement as well. So um, be that roadside testing or actually being able to test someone's blood alcohol concentration in the event um, of a crash to determine whether they were legally responsible. So our question is whether we could deem impairment due to fatigue in a similar way to how we currently deem impairment due to um, alcohol. So with alcohol, if you have a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05 legally or above, you are legally deemed to be impaired. And it's really uh, divorced from whether you are actually impaired or not. You know, plenty of people could theoretically drive safely at, you know, 0.06 because of that individual variability. But uh, we as a community have decided, look, we've drawn a line in the sand. If you're at 0.05 or above, we're deeming you legally to be impaired. So is there a way we could do the same thing for fatigue? Um, and in America at the moment, there is a law in the state of New Jersey called Maggie's Law, where it's currently illegal to drive if you've had no sleep in the previous 24 hours. So pretty permissive, really. Um, so we undertook a systematic review and meta-analysis to really just investigate if there is an evidence base to support this concept of fatigue-related deemed impairment and uh, to identify how much sleep is required to drive safely. So this is a paper that's come out uh, a couple of months ago um, in Nature and Science of Sleep um, that I'm referring to. So you can check that out if you like. Um, and we essentially screened about 2000 studies and found 61 that met our inclusion criteria across both lab and field studies that included a measure of prior sleep duration and a measure of driving performance and or driving outcomes. So these kinds of outcomes that you can see here um, and that's under both real and simulated driving conditions. So essentially what we found was that after six or seven hours of prior sleep, that's where we saw a modest level of impairment to driving performance. So things like um, standard deviation of lane, um, positioning and speeding, we, we did see some effects, um, but nothing too extreme. Uh, and this is in comparison to being well rested, so eight or more hours of sleep. And we saw that there was a crash likelihood increase of about 30% under those conditions. When people had about four or five hours of prior sleep, that's when we started to see some really significant performance decrements. So large decrements to driving performance, but also a doubling of the likelihood of a vehicle crash if you've had less than four or five hours of sleep the night before. Now we didn't see that many studies that actually looked at driving performance with less than four hours of sleep, but as you might imagine, the ones that we did see, um, that's where we saw the largest decrements to driving performance. Now, if we're thinking about a point where we could theoretically deem someone to be impaired based on prior sleep, we can think about the level of risk that we're willing to accept. So if we think about the example of blood alcohol and how much risk we're willing to accept as a community, uh, we've drawn that line in Australia at 0.05 and at 0.05 and above, uh, that's where we see a doubling of the risk of a vehicle crash. So if we were thinking about, okay, well, are we gonna equate fatigue with blood alcohol concentration, we'd be thinking, okay, well maybe four or five hours of sleep would be a reasonable place to draw that line in the sand. But we do need to consider more than just the scientific evidence when thinking about whether we could actually deem people to be impaired due to fatigue on the road. So we obviously need to think about community attitudes, um, whether people would accept a law like this, what that might look like. Um, and also the in the, I guess the perspectives of road transport, stake, road transport stakeholders and also political appetites too. Um, also enforcement, 
you know, unlike blood alcohol, there's not a roadside test where you can blow into a tube and it'll tell you how fatigued you are. Um, so maybe this type of law would be more applicable in the event of a crash. You cause a crash, we find out, we find out how much sleep you had the night before. Uh, we'd also need to consider practicalities. So, you know, it's possible that if a law like this were brought in, it would have a disproportionate impact on certain populations. So your parents, shift workers, people who are likely to have some type of sleep disruption. Uh, and also, you know, with alcohol, you're choosing to drink, whereas with fatigue, often you're not choosing to not get enough sleep. And we also would need to consider when we're talking to the public about this, we don't want people to assume that you're safe if you've had five hours of sleep or six hours of sleep. You know, we're thinking about, okay, we could have a minimum, but that doesn't mean that you would be necessarily safe above that limit. And also, you know, is public education a better way to go than legislation? These are all a range of factors that we would need to consider when thinking about how we might implement a law like this. Uh, so we are currently actually doing that. Um, we've just undertaken a community consultation and stakeholder engagement exercise to understand these potential barriers and enablers. So we're trying to figure out, okay, well, what do people think of this? Is it possible for this to be rolled out in a legislation uh, type situation or public education even? Um, and we're putting together a discussion paper for the Federal Office of Road Safety. So watch the space. Excellent. Thank you very much, Madeline. Um, we have some time for any questions. So if anybody wants to type anything into the Q&A, please do so. Um, and we can ask some questions here. Um, Madeline has been on the podcast before talking about um, FRMS systems as well. So you can you can see that and she's presented last year. If you'd like to go back and have a look at that. But this is a very interesting area, uh, Madeline, that you know, one that regardless of work actually impacts everybody. So because we all drive for different reasons. Um, but I suppose, like you said, the challenges of measuring people's sleep and even self-reporting is very hard to do and people are very bad at self-reporting their sleep as well um, and then people do things like what spencer said there a moment ago they might stop watching some sport or cricket or whatever might be going on so what i did, what did catch you... i did catch the train in this morning <laughs> <laughs> okay so we won't try under the bus we'll try under the train there um but yeah uh, but it can be um, <laughs> It can be it can be quite quite difficult to do this. What do you think practically going forward, Madeline? What what do you think might be a practical tool to to look at this? And someone's actually written in the chat here as well, which is kind of on a similar area. What tool would you use to recommend to measure fatigue? So, to measure fatigue, to measure sleep, to measure all these things, like what practically do you think may happen in the future around this? Yeah, look, I think the most likely option for this is not anything like roadside testing. You know, unless. Um, you know, that biomarker that I know a few people in the area have been chasing comes yeah. through and becomes publicly available. Um, unless that happens, I don't think there's any way we could really be relying on things like self-report or roadside testing. Um, I think really the only place that this could reasonably fit within our legislative system is in the event of a crash. So for example, I'm a driver, I cause an accident. Uh, in the same way that I would, you know, potentially be taken to a hospital to get a blood test for alcohol and drugs, then I guess in that situation, there's also the potential for police to investigate me for how much sleep I've had. So for example, if there's CCTV footage or credit card receipts and I've been out on the town all night and haven't got any sleep and then have got in the car and driven home and have uh, hit someone or killed someone, uh, there would be that evidence to investigate. But I think if we're thinking about things like self-reporting or, you know, oh, I was up a night sick with a baby there's not really any concrete evidence but i guess yeah. it's more in those more egregious circumstances that i think this probably would would fit in yeah maybe we'll just have to microchip everybody like <laughs> <laughs> um it's probably Cassie's, a step too far <laughs> yeah oh some people want that um <laughs> cassie's asked or said recently there's been a lot of work in sleep disparities across different racial and socioeconomic groups um, which runs the risk of such a law and fairly targeting these groups adding to other very, very important considerations. Yeah, it's a really good yeah. point. And I mean, I guess thinking about, you know, people that have to work long hours or yeah, people with different backgrounds, these are certainly things that would need to be considered. I mean, I guess thinking about it from a safety perspective, you know, the, the likelihood of a crash isn't going to change dependent on the reason you haven't got enough sleep, but yeah, I mean, it's almost an ethical issue more than a scientific issue at this point, you know, and and you're right, uh, 
laws like that do kind of exist for commercial drivers. So in Australia, we have like a logbook system for heavy vehicle drivers, for example, but it's more about work and rest rules in terms of the number of yeah. hours you can work and the breaks. No one's actually investigating what you're doing with those breaks and how much sleep you've actually had. So it's a bit of a difference between what they're actually able to measure. Yeah, I think they're very. It's very basic in nature and compliance driven, as we've discussed before about um, FRMS. And yeah, Cassie, you're right. Unless there's a crash, and then it kind of gets into all other stuff. You know, it's yeah. the more proactive measure about you know, do you have a sleep disorder system? You know, you know, was biomechanical modeling used? Do you have technology and so on? Where is on paper kind of goes be rules oriented, but then when something happens, it's like well, what about all this stuff? So it's like two different worlds, you know. So yeah, yeah, exactly right. Excellent. Thank you very much.